I've been reading through Isaiah lately and really enjoying that and appreciating it. And um, we're going we're gonna to talk about Isaiah some today, but um, a couple couple verses, if I can find, yeah, that stick out. Uh, come, come back to remembrance as, as you were singing is uh, in repentance and rest you will be saved in quietness and trust is your strength and so so counterintuitive in in our culture of doing our culture of functioning out of anxiety and pressure and oh, I gotta work harder I gotta do more and Jesus said, no, repent and rest in me. You'll find salvation. And in quietness and trust in the restorative, restorative space, that's where you, you gain your strength. Um, you can go ahead and take the kids. We'll be praying for you guys. All right, and you guys can have a seat. Good morning again. Um, I was going. You can. No, it's, it's over now. Like. <laughs> I think. Can I use your your deal there? Not your iPad, but your this thing. Are you gonna need it again later? Oh, it's a tablet. It's <laughs> tablets are like tablets are like Kleenex deets, right? What does that mean? It means that like all tablets are iPads, <laughs> the same way that all facial tissue is called Kleenex. You see, come on. There's only there's a couple people here that got that. <clears throat> And I'm really glad you really, I do want to re-clarify, for those of you who were here for the greeting, it sounded a little funny because um, it sounded like I didn't want to be here, okay? <laughs> and I do want to be, I love you guys, like, <laughs> you got that vibe? That's not what I was going for. I just would have liked to have a little more vacation, yeah. all right? Like, we could have we used an extra week, nevertheless, really glad to be here with you guys. Um, please don't let me forget about communion, both uh, traditionally uh, at, the end of our, at the end of our time and then also in the courtyard. Let me pray and um, man, we'll get into what God has for us because I, I, I think it's good. Jesus, thank you again. Um, uh, we use these moments, Lord, to, um, to transition into the sermon, right? And we don't want to come come at you like that. Uh, let us take this moment to breathe, to remember the safe space that we come into, that restful, restorative space that we come into with you, and we just make ourselves vulnerable before you, Lord. Let us let us have um, multiple hearts. Lord, I lift up the kids and their time, and when I do that, I don't just pray that because we always pray that. Like I really mean, ask that you would bless their time, their time with my wife. Bless her; she loves on them and leads them. Um, bless them, Father, as they continue to form life-giving relationships. And we pray that that these guys would, these boys and girls would grow to be like kingdom servants in this community and the communities that you call them to. Pray that they would be world changers, kingdom endorsers. Pray that uh, for them, Lord. And, and, and Lord, as we reaccept that call, um, I pray that your spirit would speak really clearly to each and every one of us this morning because, um, you know, when I think about the people in this room, Lord, we're a group of people that are about this life. And, and it's real tempting to go through the motions but I pray that you would um, reignite us and um, 
And I pray that it would come not from clever words that, that I might share, but, but through a conviction and a prompting of your Holy Spirit. So bless this morning together for your glory. And um, bless my words, my heart, that I would um, unapologetically, boldly, authentically um, share for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Hey, we are we are we are a church that is on the incline. We are a growing church. We we are on the we're on a journey and we are on the incline. And we better watch our step. We better watch out. We better watch our step. I've found that like as we are as we are growing, I noticed something recently. Maybe I'm more sensitive than you guys are, but like I notice that our conversations amongst leadership, we talk about this, Max, Brianne, elders, we talk about this. Our conversations become as we grow, our conversations often become less about Jesus and more about other things, more about um, things that don't matter as much as him. There's, a, there's a, a saying that I've heard for a long time, I don't know where it came from, but it says, where, where your focus goes, right? Have you heard this? Where your focus goes, your energy flows. Where your focus goes, your energy flows. You give of yourself to where you're focused, what you're focused on. And so if if we become if, if we become distracted or not fixed and focused like we talked about a couple years ago on Jesus, and our energy stops flowing towards him and our abiding connection, which is Free flowing, filled with spiritual nourishment as we are connected to the vine, attached, remain, abiding, finding our home in Him, our fulfillment in Him. Energy starts to flow elsewhere if we don't remain connected and abiding in Him. And that's why Jesus said, Man, hey, abide, remain, stay right here, stay with me. If you've been uh, reading John Mark Comer's book, then you're welcome. Uh, that's the orange one that we've been passing around. If you haven't and you would like, you're still interested in that, please like let us know. You can get it on Amazon, or we'll get one for you. Whatever, whatever's helpful to you um, to get going on that. But it's it's been good, and we're going to continue the conversation about that book in our community. But similar to where your focus goes, your energy flows. He says, what you give your attention to is what you become. What you give your attention to is what you become. And so there's nothing more special about our church, community, little C church, as a part of the big kingdom, big C church, right? There's nothing special or unique. We're not immune to the temptations of other community churches. And so for years, I've heard and been aware of the three Bs. And the three Bs is the three-headed monster that rears its ugly heads in church communities. It's the temptation to, to put our focus not on Jesus, but it's the temptation to put our focus on the three Bs. Budgets, buildings, and butts in the seats. Budgets, buildings, butts in the seats. So I watch. I watch us grow. And I watch our, I conclude myself in this, I watch our attention go from, oh, Jesus, to, oh, Jesus, look what you're doing. Oh, my gosh. Project. Ooh, increase. Oh, people. I hope they come back, right? Trying to, trying to train myself to prepare and not find identity in the crowd, because that's a temptation that, that uh, 
we don't talk about enough. But to, to try to just make myself, my, have my identity in Jesus and make myself available to whoever God wants us to love on and share life giving community with on Sundays. But not to find our identity in how many people were there. How many? The Bible talks about numbers for sure, but in the Lamb's Book of Life are written names of humans, names of souls. So we got to care about people's names over care about the number. Um, I want to tell you a story about Coach. Met this guy recently. We're going to call him Coach. Coach went to... Um, he went off to college, and he was he 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 was he was the minority. A black man went off to college, and he was studying advertising. And a great student, crushing it, really excited to move away after graduation and begin his career in advertising and marketing and really do well. And close to his time of graduation, he was out hanging out with, with friends out on in in the town. And uh, like most college people do. And there was an interaction with some bouncers. There was, um, they were waiting outside of a, of a bar, interaction with some bouncers, some police officers. And um, somebody got pushed around and roughed up by one of the bouncers. So he wanted to come to that person's aid. And so he's trying to get the police officer's attention. And, um, and, 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 and kind of come to the, you know, to the aid of this other person. And so at one point, physically tap them on the shoulder. Hey, sir, we're trying to get your attention over here. This person needs some help. But apparently, of course, the police officer didn't like that. So as this person turns around uh, and walks away to go back to the situation to be helpful, um, gets tased. And then ends up having this case where uh, he's arrested and um, accused of assaulting a police officer. So this happens at the end of the graduation. He's ready to go home and start his, his advertising career. And um, then come to find out now he's dealing with this trial in this case. And they're trying to keep him around town. He's got no job. They're... Finally, he... He accepts a plea to where he can move back home, but he has to do like hundreds of hours of community service. And he accepts this plea because if he goes to trial and he say, he doesn't have any money, any resources to stay at school where he leaves. So the only way for him to get back home is to just go into this plea deal. Right? So his... his um, I guess punishment or whatever was to was to do a few hundred hours of community service. So he goes home and he gets involved with this uh, this organization called Outward Bound. And Outward Bound is is a youth organization that helps um, youth in the community kind of turn their lives around and 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 lead them, raise them up to be great young men and women. So he serves like his hundreds of hours in Outward Bound, and at the end of his time, one of his other instructors, people he was working with, says, you know what? You're really good with kids. You should work with kids. You should think about doing this. And so he starts working with kids, had a degree in advertising that he never did anything with, and he started working with kids, and he's been coaching and leading and serving communities and helping youth grow and mentoring children ever since. And, and really kind of climbing the chain of influence and doing really well. Powerful story, right? Can you imagine how sad it would be if Coach ever stopped living for the kids? If Coach ever stopped making it about the kids? If Coach ever started making it about his organizations or his success? I look at, I look at um, the, the club sports scene, and this isn't to bash the entire club sports scene, 
But like when it becomes about money and venture and selfish ambition and personal gain, rather than the original focus, it becomes tragic. Satan would love to distract us from the very thing that he positions us for and calls us to. So it's awesome to see this beautiful calling on Coach's life and the development. Now, Coach has not turned away from pouring into the kids, but who wouldn't want to be involved with a guy like Coach? Who doesn't want to, to, to advocate for Coach? Who doesn't want to bring their kids to be in alignment with Coach and his leadership? But it's a big tragedy when we start to get focused on other things, and that's what Satan would love to do. He would love to distract us. I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm actually easily distracted. <laughs> Me? <laughs> Trump, <laughs> cue the Trump, Trump gif. <laughs> Me? Distracted? <laughs> Never. <laughs> I, sometimes I got to cue my GPS just to, to, to go home, you know? It's hilarious because even with the GPS on, I often will check into something else and go right past my turn. Often. And what does my GPS tell me? Rerouting. Recalculating. And so today, I think God is calling us to recalibrate. And for some of you guys, you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, I wasn't worried about any of this. I didn't even know. Exactly. That's good. That's, that's good. That means we weren't too far down the road. But um, it's important for us to recalibrate and make sure we're staying focused on what God has called us to do. And, and, and the thing is, like, as I read the scriptures, the scriptures are filled with recalculating moments, rerouting moments. But the destination, is, the destination doesn't change. <clears throat> uh, you can turn with me to Isaiah. Book of Isaiah, chapter 29. We're going to look at uh, 13 through 16. Isaiah, chapter 29. What we're going to look at is, this is, I mean, this is, this is the rhythm of God's people, right? We're connected with God, and then we get distracted. And then, then God has to recalibrate, recalculate his people. Hey, come on back to me. Come on back to me. So this is very much so Isaiah speaking up and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You guys are going in the wrong direction. Uh, so Isaiah 29, verse 13. Then the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service. Love that, their lip service. But they remove their hearts far from me. They've removed their hearts from me. And their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by, by rote. Does anybody know what rote means? Repetition, meaningless, thoughtless repetition, unintelligible, mechanical routine. That's what rote means. It says their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people. And we pray for the Lord to deal marvelously. Do marvelous things, Lord. But not, 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 not. Sometimes the marvelous thing that God has to do is, is, the, is the brilliant work of recalculation. He says, I will once again deal marvelously with this people. Wondrously marvelous. That's, you just hear the sarcasm. And God, oh, I'll do something for you. I got you. We're going to correct this. 
And the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Now, in this next, these next couple of verses, there's going to be four sayings or, or, um, that I want us to pick up on. So we'll, we'll unpack it. So, verse 15, woe to, the, woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord and whose deeds are done in a dark place. And they say, who sees us? Or who knows us? You turn things around. You got it backwards. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, he did not make me. Or what is formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding. He doesn't know what he's doing. God doesn't know what he's doing. We get it backwards, and rather than, than living life as if Jesus doesn't have his eye on us, that he's not intimately involved and aware of what we got going on, we say, who sees us? Who sees me? What we should be saying is, Jesus, you see me. You got your eyes on there's a couple different ways we can look at that, right? Jesus, the two, two different tones that we could have. When Jesus says, like, like I see you, I got my eyes on you. When we, when we confess that Jesus sees us, it could be, hey, I see, I see you. I see what you're doing. I see what, I see what you're up to. Or where we want to be is in the sweet spot of, I see you. I see you, Mike. I see what you're up to, man. I see you. I got my eyes on you. I smile upon that. I'm, that's worth celebrating. That's the place we want to be. So we shouldn't be people that are hiding our deeds and, and, and going about this world as if God is not intimately involved with our every single step, our every move. Saying, ah, God doesn't care about me. He doesn't know what's going on. No, 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 no. We need to be the people that's acknowledging, not getting it backwards, but acknowledging, God, you see me. And what's the next question that's asked in 15? Who sees us or who knows us? God, you see me? And you know me. Again, two different tones that we can take with that statement. Um, I know you, bro. Right? Like me and my, my, my short attention span. Am I easily distracted? Dude, I know you. I know what you're going to do. I know everything about you. Let's correct this. Right? And then we should be the ones embracing, not asking, like, who sees me? Who knows me? Like, God, you see me and you know me so well. Please steer my every thought, word, and deed. Please direct me. So we're called to be people who understand that God sees us. He knows us. And then verse 16, not acknowledging that he did not make us, but not, not only did you see me, not only do you know me, but you made me. You made me with great purpose. And you have all understanding. But when, it, when it's backwards, we say, hey, he doesn't know what he's doing. What is God, what are you doing? You don't know what you're doing with why you called me to this space or you called me to this community or you called me to this workplace or to these relationships. You don't know what you're doing. No, 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 no. God sees you. He knows you. He made you. And he's got perfect wisdom for right where you're at. And so Isaiah... Um, rebukes rebukes these people for forgetting to involve him intimately in their life. And they were just going through the motions. They were just going through the motions. And their hearts were far from, far from him. And so our temptation is to now oh, go through the church motions. Right? Oh, we got it. Another project going. Oh, we got another event going on. But our hearts can't be far from Jesus. That's the most important thing. That we're reconnected, abiding. And so um, I want to remind us of, of our mission and kind of what we're about with our community, right? Does anybody know what... Um, kind of a, the go-to scripture of our, of our mission of Christ Community Church? 
Anybody know our go-to scripture? It's not shame on you, it's shame on me. Any, any guessers? Huh? It's on our website. Does anybody remember the, the, our, our, our goal, our mission statement as, as a church? It's on our business cards and our sign. It's three words. Come on, thank you. Come, change, commission. We define a disciple because we're, we're a disciple-making church, right? That's about the mission that Jesus has given us. And so uh, we define a disciple by somebody who comes to follow Jesus, to abide in, in a relationship with Jesus. We've really grabbed a hold of that value of, of abiding. So when I think of coming and following Jesus, I think of abiding in him, following him, remaining in him. And when that happens, we begin to change. I don't know about you, but I can reflect on over the last five years. I'm like, dang, dude. Like, I was having a conversation. My wife and I were, um, were with uh, some people from our community on Friday. And we reflected the next day. And she's like, man, you are not the same dude. Like, this is great. I really, you know, not that I was trash before, but like, <laughs> she's like, I really like this. Like, because I reflect on my relationship with Jesus, my following and abiding in Him, and it's transformative. I change. Now, I don't change just so I can become some great individual and, and about my selfishness. I, I change so that I can be commissioned into inviting others into this come change, and then they be commissioned, right? So we grow as disciples. So that's how we define it. But there's a scripture that we use uh, to, to get that definition. Does anybody remember what that one is? Anybody been on the website in the last four minutes to look it up? What did you say? Did you go on the website? You did, didn't you? Love you. It's great. It's all right. You're so resourceful, Ben. Matthew 4.19. And so Matthew 4.19 says, Follow me, I will make, and I will make you fishers of men. But as I was reading that this morning, I, I, I had to look at, um, this is so cool. God's always got something new for you, right? So I was looking at 4.18 as well. It says, now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus knew these guys from the community. This wasn't the first time they had seen each other. This wasn't their first time seeing Jesus. This wasn't Jesus' first time seeing them. He knew where they worked. He, he was out in the marketplace. He was by the sea. He was, he was by the port. And he ran into these guys. And he's had his eye on them. And there had probably already been some type of connection. And Jesus says, hey there, fellas. Hey there, um, come follow me. Come, be with me, abide in me. Let's, let's build this friendship, more than a friendship, right, Deets? Let's build this, and in that, you're going to be changed. I'm going to make you, I will make you. Come follow me, I will make you. I'm going to transform you. I'm going to make you into something. I'm going to build you up and raise you up into something. That sounds much deeper than rote. That sounds like life-giving relationship, sharing of community, transformative, life-giving relationship, not done through um, thoughtless, meaningless, ritualistic action. Not saying that they're not going to be disciplined. Jesus knows these are disciplined guys. They get up before everybody else. They fish all night. Jesus knows what they're capable of. He knows their makeup. He says, hey, you guys, you come follow me. We're going to turn you into something special. I'm going to make you transform you into fishers of men. I'm going to use all of your unique makeup. Man. Hey, fellas, I see you. I know what you're made of. I made you. I know what I'm doing. Come follow me. I swear I didn't plan that connection with the Isaiah scripture. Did you catch that? Isn't that awesome? I see you, man. Hey, guys, I see you. I got my eyes on you. I know what you got in you. I made you, and I know what I'm doing. Come follow me. 
You got what it takes. You're going to be fishers of men. Recalibrating and recalculating requires us to change our metrics. Are we still a growing church in quality? Are we still growing? Because Jesus said, apart from me, you can't do anything. Abide in me, and then you'll bear much fruit. The fruit comes, the growth, the produce comes from our connection in him. The produce comes from our coming and following and abiding. Are we still a growing church? It's hard to measure sometimes because it's not measured by... It is true that, um, that the aesthetics of our, um, of our, the things we steward can be reflective of the internal growth, right? It can be an indicator. Projects and movement and, and getting things done and making improvements amongst the things that we steward, that can be a great thing. But it's not the end all be all. It's one gauge of growth. Remember, I said recently, like, I, I care less about people coming to church every Sunday. I care more about us connecting with Jesus daily. It's just more important. It's more important. Sunday's just accountability, Sunday's corporate. But if, but if, but if, if we're, if we're spiritual zombies, then we're just a collection of, of dry bones. But if we're people that are sharing this life experience with Jesus and we come together, then it's electric. Uh, I, I started doing some... Um, for years, my side hustle was working in the entertainment industry, and I think I've shared with you guys recently, that's slowed down a lot through the last couple of years. I started, I'm, I'm starting, well, I've been doing some part-time teaching with Heritage Christian School, teaching Bible. And I met this uh, co-worker the other day who's a part of a church revitalization. And um, it's not the guy you're thinking of, Brooke, it's a different guy. <laughs> uh, but that guy was cool, too. Uh, but the, met this other guy. I don't think I told you about him. He he's a part of a church revitalization, and so we were just chopping it up. You know, there's different ways to to look at this. Sometimes in church revitalization, um, uh, there's there's a remnant that stays around, and and it's really a big pruning, and then new there's there's life that births again. Sometimes sometimes church revitalization looks more like a church death and burial, and then a new birth of a new generation, right? And, and the way he described it, which I thought was beautiful, is he's like, for us, it's really more like there was a church and it kind of disappeared. And then a new church reappeared. I thought that was a really cool way of looking at it, right? Um, and, and so he was sharing, he came in kind of like the, the latter part of this revitalization process, and he said, this, I'm, I'm sharing this story as a part of rewiring and, and looking differently at how we look at the metrics of church because it's not, just, it's not just buildings, budgets, and butts and seats. And mind you, that is, that's part of our gauge, but it's not the only metric that we use. He asked this pastor, I thought this was so wise, he's like, how, do you, how do you know revitalization is going to be happening? And this pastor's response was brilliant. He said, it will be the Spirit of God working through the Word of God in the people of God. It'll be the Spirit of God working through the Word of God in the people of God that are abiding in Him and living it out in fruitful ways. Isn't that cool? Spirit of God. 
working through the Word of God in the people of God. I get a lot of people that come in usually during a week onto our campus, and a lot of times they say the same thing. People come into our church, people come onto our campus, and they go, what am I, what am I about to say? They look around and they say, nice church. Nice church. But it's usually just me and the other person. And so I shamefully rewire their, their theology. And I say, thank you. This is our campus. These are our buildings that our church stewards. But I would love for you to meet some of the people of our church because they're rad. Because what do I always say? The church is not psh, this building. It's us. It's us. We are the church. I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to share a couple stories, and then um, Deets, I'll, I'll cue you up, and you can come up here and for, play for a little bit of time or reflection. And then, um, if we have time, I would like to. I would just like to know, like, what's Jesus saying to you guys this morning? What's He putting on your hearts? Okay, no pressure to share. Um, but I want to share this story. Uh, I, I shared this. A, probably a couple of years ago now, but um, I think it really jives well with, with what our content that we're talking about this morning. It says, once upon a time, there was a region on the northeast coast that was very dangerous for ships because of many hidden shoals and rocks and sudden unexpected storms. Ships were being sunk, lives were being lost, families broken apart, and many sailors injured, um, injured for life because of shipwrecks in the, in the area. One day, a concerned individual came up with an idea. Why not build a life-saving station in this area? Its purpose would be to warn ships in advance and to rescue those who are wrecked. He shared his idea with a few friends and neighbors, and before long, they had built a life-saving station bought boats and buoys, and even built a lighthouse. It was such a good idea that many people joined in. Many lives were saved. Many families held together. Many injuries avoided. For years, people were proud of the good that the life-saving station did. Over a period of time, the life-saving station became a central part of their lives. They held, they held fellowship suppers, social events, and special meetings at the building. Then one day, some of the members of the life-saving station decided that the old building needed repair. The furniture was worn, the seats and facilities uncomfortable, so the people decided to build a new life-saving station. When it was completed, they had the largest, most beautiful, most functional life-saving building around. They increased the number of activities in the building. They held all kinds of social events. More and more people came became a part of, the, of their life, excuse me, more and more people became a part of their life-saving fellowship. But a strange thing was happening. Fewer and fewer people were willing to go out and warn the ships. And even fewer were willing to go out in a storm to rescue sailors from a, wreck, from a wrecked ship. The activities at the life-saving station took all their time. They just didn't have time to save lives. And they decided, they decided to hire others, professional lifesavers, to do the job for them. They could support the life-saving station without becoming directly involved in the difficult, unpleasant job of saving lives. Several years later, the members of the life-saving station decided that the life-saving activities were taking too much of their money. It was costing more and more to support their life-saving station and its activities in the manner to which they had become accustomed. They needed the funds to support their life-saving station, so they stopped paying the professional lifesavers. Many years later, a member of the life-saving station asked what their purpose was. Why, of course, answered a member, to provide a nice place for us and our families to fellowship, to have our community and social events. Why do you ask?
my, my prayer. And here's the thing, like, God's doing a new thing. What he's calling us to do, sometimes I don't know. It's going to look different. It already does look different. feels different. I do not want our community to be the story of the life-saving station. But I know we will be tempted to do so. I already have been. And so that's why we got to recalibrate, refocus, fix our eyes on Jesus. Over the, over the last five years, I was really encouraged um, by something the Lord showed me as I was watching the movie The Martian. Anybody familiar with that movie, The Martian? Yeah. Matt Damon is their... their He's a part of a, an astronaut crew that travels to Mars, and there's an accident. And, and his crew thinks that he's dead, so they leave him on Mars. Problem is, he's not dead, and so they take off and leave him on Mars. He's left with no food. He's stuck. The thing is, Matt da Damon is a master gardener. He's a botanist. So he's got a few potatoes, and um, he figures out a way to, uh, to create a soil and a fertilizer uh, based off of their human waste. Follow me? And so he creates this greenhouse with his potatoes and the composted waste, and he, 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 um, he tries to make a harvest of potatoes on Mars. And every day he would go out there and check on his, his crops or his, his field, right? He makes this little greenhouse in their space station on Mars. Every day he goes out and checks. Every day he goes out and checks. Nothing. Nothing. And he's losing hope. He's running out of food. And then one morning, he's brushing his teeth, and he peeks, and he bends down, and, and you just see out of, the, out of the dirt this little, teeny little sprout, this little green hope of life. And he bends down, and he goes, hey there. Man, ministry in this culture is hard. And when we decide to not focus our attention on the metrics of buildings, budgets, and butts and seats, and we, we, take, we take a deeper look at, at the dire spiritual matters of things in our culture, and it looks really grim at times, it's scary. But over the last few years, I would be really hopeful when every once in a while, God would give me a hey there moment where it clicked and, and, and Mike and Mimi show up and, and start living for Jesus and get baptized. You know, it would click when an old friend might come into our community just to be an encouragement. You know, or, or, or somebody with the name Alwag says, hey, man, I just feel called to contribute. You know, and, and, and every time a moment like that would happen, and it's not just like new. I mean, there's, there's people, I've seen people walking with the Lord for years. And I've had meaningful conversations that, that reveal the transformation that's happened in their hearts. And it's like, dang, Jesus, you are really moving. But no one is here to see it and really understand it, but me and you. And it's in those moments, and it's in those moments that were my hey there moments. It was like, I'm just going throughout my day, 
fishing, casting my nets, mending my nets, and then all of a sudden, hey there. Well, the hey there moments have, have increased. The hey there moments are, 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 are regular. Now, it's the community around our church. It's the community that we're in that other people are saying, hey there. Hey. There's going to be a lot more of that. There already is becoming a harvest and if you've seen the Martian, he gets comfortable. Well, I don't know if he really ever gets comfortable on Mars, right? But he, he, he begins to develop an abundance of the harvest, and then there's an accident, and all his crops are destroyed, right? And so we are going to have to be very vigilant. Our church is on the incline, but we've got to watch our step. We've got to watch our backs, we have to stay prayerful. We have to stay repentant. We have to stay fixed and focused on Jesus. We have to never forget that we are called to come and abide in him, come and follow him. And it's through the transformation, uh, the fruitful transformation of change in our hearts, of growth in our hearts, of spiritual growth, not just the outward manifestations, not just the aesthetically pleasing um, uh, signs of the inward growth, but it's the inward spiritual growth that is most important. And then we also have to remember that it's not just about us. Jesus, Jesus invites us into this so that we can be commissioned to make more disciples. That's still what this is about. Come change commission. Um, Deets, you can come on up here, man. Uh, the call is still for, for us to abide in Christ together and to be on the lookout for other ships that might need our help. To be sensitive to the Spirit to the person in your community, the person in your circle, the person that you see on Sundays or the person that you see on Mondays at the market. To be sensitive that we are still life-saving people that are in a relationship with a life-saving God. And be sensitive to the Spirit so that when we see a ship on the horizon of our unique context, that we will have the wherewithal, the outward focusedness, if that's even an accurate, I don't even know if that makes sense, the, the outward awareness to say, ah, oh, hey there. I see you. I'd like to get to know you so that you can understand the God that made us who understands you. Hey there. It's that easy, man. Just hey there. Being intentional with relationships. Um, I'm going to let Dietz play. And then um, I want you to take a few minutes to just reflect. And then I would, I would love to know um, some of what the Spirit is pressing on you. Um, and you know what, too? We, we can do communion, too, right now. Thank you for... Thanks for that. So Dietz is going to play. You can reflect... Help yourself to communion in the back if you want to do that now or if you want to wait and do it later, you're welcome to do that. Um, but make this a time of reflection and I look forward to hearing what God's placing on your heart this morning.